Professor Cummings. The clip that you just saw was from La Crusette. They're a manufacturer of cast iron kitchen products or cookery products, cast iron skillets, cast iron pots, baking dishes. You know, their whole uh, inventory is of cast metal products, particularly cast iron. They go through an enamel process and, and other things to make them more decorative, but at the core, it's metal casting. And that's what this video is going to be about. I just wanted to go through the basics of metal casting, kind of give you a definition of metal casting and some of the major vocabulary that defines metal casting. So let's get started on this one. So metal casting, what, what is that? It's, it's actually one of the oldest manufacturing processes and also one of the most basic or it can be one of the most basic and it can also be an extremely sophisticated process. So what it is, the, the textbook definition is the process of pouring molten metal into a hollow cavity and allowing it to cool and solidify into a desired shape. And that solidified part is what's known as a casting. So the end product of a, cast, a casting process is the casting itself. It's not necessarily a finished product. There's usually some sort of finishing and polishing and machining and other things that have to take place on it to get it to where the end user, you know, the, the actual customer needs it. But, you know, it does have a finished product that comes out of this. And, you know, that's known as the casting. So the cast metal cools and becomes your new part, the, the casting. Now, this is used in a lot of different industries. You know, it's, uh, your automotive uses a lot for connecting rods, engine blocks, and other components. As you can see, it, uh, uh, this is used a lot in the culinary industry or cookery industry. Aerospace uses them a lot. Uh, the railroad industry uses it. Uh, naval, a lot of uh, ship components. And one thing a lot of people don't know is jewelry is actually uh, done with a certain type of casting process. It's called a, a lost wax process. Now, speaking of different types of processes, you know, there's also different types of molds, you know, with each one of these processes. Now, you know, the molds can be extremely sophisticated or extremely simple. You know, it just depends on what you're trying to cast, you know, the, the urgency of the process, you know, the lead times, uh, the volume that you're trying to cast, you know, are you just doing one part or are you doing, you know, several hundreds or possibly thousands. Also, the precision could play a big part in it, as well as the budget that you're using. So, so some of the processes, and this is by no means a, a comprehensive list. You know, you can have permanent molds. You know, some type of permanent mold, which you oftentimes see in the automotive industry. You know, it's something where you're actually making a a cast uh, wheel, you know, aluminum cast wheels, or other components will have a permanent mold made out of some sort of material that can withstand and deal with the amount of heat you know of this molten metal without being destroyed you know so that's a permanent mold for in some cases you know you can have a very simple mold you know this is known as a sand mold and it's actually a special type of sand or a sand mixture of, of clay sand and other components where you can actually make a mold that actually gets destroyed at each uh, each time you use it you know so you actually have a pattern you form the sand around that pattern pull the pattern out and now you've got a cavity a mold cavity that you can actually pour molten metal in and get your component out like I said this is typically for a one-off you know if you want to make this component you have to redo the sand casting over and over again which isn't necessarily a, a really expensive or time-consuming process but it is a process and that is a sand molding and um, the next one or another one is a shell mold and you can see this is another process where the mold is actually uh, typically destroyed during the process but you know also it's not a very expensive process so you have again some sort of a, a pattern you know and then they, an adhesive is put onto the pattern you know sand is you know stuck to the adhesive you know it's cured you pull the pattern out and then you put the two top and bottom portions together you know this you know this top portion and this bottom portion you know that actually close in together forming the mold cavity and you pour molten metal in that and then you basically have to break the shell mold apart in order to get your casting out of it so there and, and you know there's several different types there's a lost sand process there's a lost wax process uh, there's you know several different there, there's composite molds so there's several different types of, of mold processes that you can possibly have and again it just depends on 
what your goal is, you know, the cost, the budget, the volume, uh, precision, you know, because they have a, a variety of different capabilities. And so, you know, you, there's several different methods you might want to take up in terms of casting. But there is a lot of things that castings, no matter whether they're permanent mold or molds like the sand cast or sand mold or shell mold or, you know, even lost foam and lost wax processes that, that they have in common. So this is a green sand casting, sort of the, the middle one that we looked at, just a, a basic schematic of it. And I wanted to go through the different components that you will find in the molding process or in a mold design. And like I said, you know, molds typically have all of these components in them. Some might have a couple less, some might have more, depending on how complex the part is. But, you know, these are components that apply to all the casting processes. You know, first, there is an upper portion. You know, typically there's an upper portion known as the cope. And the cope in this schematic would be this portion here. This is the cope. So it's the top portion of the mold. You know, it actually fits over this lower portion, you know, por a part of the mold cavity and other uh, components of the mold process are located in this cope, uh, cope portion of the mold. Now, along with the cope, there's a lower portion, which is known as the drag. So this portion down here is what's known as the drag. And the drag, like I said, is just the bottom. It fits together with the cope. So you have a cope and a drag and a portion of your mold cavity, as well as other components of the mold that we'll go into, are going to be part of the drag. So you have an upper and a lower portion, so it sandwiches together. And this is what forms you know, your, your generic mold. Okay, so that's the cope and the drag. Now, as you get more into your component and the whole metal pouring process and how you're going to do this and still, you know, get a good component out of it, you have something called the gating system. What the gating system is, is the plumbing of the mold. You know, you can think of it as analogous to a plumbing system. So you've got these different passageways throughout your, your mold going into the mold cavity you know, and, and and outward that allow passage of molten metal. And, it you know, the gating system can actually be fairly sophisticated because what it does is it does control the flow rate and the manner in which that molten metal passes through. And it has to be able to pass through all this molten metal in a timely enough manner to do two things. One, to fill the mold cavity without solidifying before you know before the whole mold the metal actually solidifies as well as not pour it too fast so that you end up getting a lot of turbulence a lot of air entrained into the molten metal the liquid metal and possibly having a lot of air pockets and porosity in your finished casting so the gating system is made up of a, a few things so you have a pouring basin or just a basin which is up here at the top the, the basin and the basin is just a metering device. You know, it's a metering device for the flow of metal. So, you know, the, the crucible or the, the ladle is poured into the pouring basin. You know, the pouring basin fills up and it meters the molten metal into the mold. The next thing into, uh, that comes into the casting process is the sprue. Now, the sprue, you can think of it as the main feed line into the, into the casting or into the mold. So it comes from this pouring basin, you know, goes down into the 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 sprue, and this is where the whole casting process actually starts in, as far as the, the liquid metal actually starts to show up into the mold. So it goes in through this sprue, and it runs into something called the choke. Now the choke is just another mechanism that controls the flow rate. So this is your choke. It's a mechanism that controls the flow rate. Now you got to remember this molten metal is free falling down the sprue. So it, it is picking up a lot of speed, potentially getting air bubbles, particularly getting air pockets, and it can potentially be turbulent flow. So what this choke does is it slows down the flow of the metal so that it doesn't just race into your, your component, into your mold cavity, you know, with a lot of air trapped in it. So it helps regulate or slow down the, the flow rate of the molten metal. The next thing you have is a runner. Now the runner, here we have the, the runner 
all it is is a passage way through the mold. So think of this as just the plumbing, another portion of plumbing, the, the piping that goes, f you know, from the choke and, you know, just traveling through the, the mold, the mold body and eventually taking the molten metal where it needs to go. Now, in this one, it's just a fairly simple one. So you have one runner, but in other cases, you might have several components inside of a mold that needs to have, you know, several lines of runners going to each one of those. So, it, you know, again, think of it like a plumbing system. Now, you have something called the gate. The gate, you know, located here is just the port or the passage that actually enters into the mold cavity. So it's just an entrance way into the mold cavity. And sometimes the diameter of this gate is controlled and regulated if you need to slow down or, or speed up the flow of metal going into the mold cavity. But primarily it's just the entrance way into a mold cavity. The next portion is the mold cavity itself. So this is actually what gets you your end product. What gets you your end product and and it's a, you know typically special not typically it it is especially designed to have certain features that you're going to want in your final casting you know you might not have all the particular holes or threaded sections or you know clearances or final finishes on it but you know it gives you your your actual casting that you're wanting to work with you know and from there you know you have a a final product or a product as far as the casting process goes now one thing that shows up in a lot of processes not necessarily but you know it typically is a good idea to have this particularly for more complicated portions with complex geometries is something called a riser now a riser is just a reservoir that holds molten metal to help mitigate shrinkage what does that mean so you've got a mold cavity you know the mold cavity fills up you know there might be some thin wall sections it might be other areas here that you're a little concerned with now molten metal is hot and as molten metal cools down it will shrink it'll contract you know so you have this thing called a riser which is specially designed to cool down and solidify last you know you design it so it could solidify last based on the shape as well as the overall sides so it turns into a reservoir and as your metal in your casting or your mold cavity starts to shrink or cool down and contract this works as a reservoir to send molten metal back in as a backfill for areas that may actually have some shrinkage issues and that's you know really the sole purpose or well, the primary purpose of a riser <coughs> excuse me another purpose of it is it can potentially vent you know any gases or so if there's any porosity it can help uh, you avoid having any loose pockets or empty pockets in here because you know it allows the gases to come out as it backfills with molten metal <laughs> and, you know, and so that's you know the other secondary purposes of the riser so that is the molding process or so general very generic overview of the molding process as well as the different components you know, that will be in a, a mold now, this is Professor Cummings uh, thanks for listening